cross drill and, and note, know it by name. Anyone wanna wanna make a guess? It was goose step like Nazis used to do. But that's really interesting that that's what came came to mind for you. Um, so this lacrosse drill, when my kids played lacrosse, they called it the Frankenstein drill. And um, we were actually doing an education program in New Hampshire. And two of the students who were high school students were kind of, this is like the only thing that got them kind of interested, but they finally revealed that their coach called it the Hitler drill. And, and that was really troubling. And we got into a pretty interesting conversation with them. One of the boys was, um, you know, sort of like the bench warmer and he didn't want to make waves. He was one of the few Jewish kids at the high school. Um, he didn't want his parents to get involved, but after the season, his mother did call the athletic director and the principal on a sort of, a, I don't think she called, she sent in like an anonymous letter nothing happened. And this all came out like a year later when we were doing this training with them. So we kind of talked it over and tried to figure out a way to, to address this issue without calling out any one school and without making this particular student feel singled out. What we were able to do was contact the, um, the New Hampshire Youth Lacrosse Association as well as the State Department of Education and ask them to communicate to all of their members that using the name Hitler to describe a drill was not acceptable. And we explained why that word was so offensive to so many and um, asked them to, you know, without pointing fingers, but just saying, this is a teachable moment. Students who are offended by this are not going to be comfortable speaking out but you should be able to instruct every school in your state that this is not, this isn't acceptable. So they sent this out. Um, this is, you know, an excerpt of the letter that went out. Um, and, you know, they say, well, it may appear to be fairly harmless. It's important for school districts to be cognizant of language used. This is an opportunity for school districts to set the tone for the conduct of youth sports in a manner that is respectful and mindful of all. So, um, you know, I, I raise this because, you know, what happens in high school and how the students feel comfortable or empowered to speak up, it's a complicated topic, particularly in that power dynamic, but being able to come to ADL, come to other trusted community members, there are often ways to make the point without having anyone be singled out. Um, in, in ways that are uncomfortable for, you know, for teenagers. Moving ahead now to, I think what's been one of the most publicized incidents of uh, anti-Semitism in sports in, in recent memory is uh, professional football and Deshaun Jackson's statement. You know, his statement was a, a quote by, uh, about Jews from Hitler and I'm not gonna read it, but it, it was pretty offensive. And um, he posted two images on his Instagram story, quoting Hitler and essentially saying that Jews will blackmail America, extort America, their plan for world domination won't work if uh, Negroes know who they are. The white citizens of America will be terrified to know all of this by the time, um, it, to know that all this time they've been mistreating and discriminating and lynching the children of Israel. So in response, uh, Pittsburgh Steeler offensive lineman Zach Banner decided to film a really moving video to share his thoughts. He put in that video, we need to understand Jewish people deal with the same amount of hate and similar hardships and hard times. Um, our local hero, New England um, Patriot Julian Edelman, um, urged Deshaun Jackson to visit the U.S. Holocaust Museum and uh, told him that if they visit the museum together, he'd um, also accompany him on a trip to the National Museum of African American History and Culture to learn more from Jackson as well. So they made plans to educate each other. And... Uh, 
and I, in a moment, I'll play some of how Julian Edelman handled this and use social media as a way to get out a message that no other spokesman in America is really able to get out quite as effectively. Um, before we get to that, um, I, I will let you know that ADL, along with many, many other groups, um, responded and asked for an apology. Um, and as did the uh, you know, ADL in our Philadelphia office, asking again for an apology. Um, and, and that is uh, where it starts. And we will spend a few minutes um, talking about that apology. So Julian Edelman um, noted that anti-Semitism is one of the oldest forms of hatred. And he said, I see an opportunity for a conversation. Um, he noted that the world needs to see a little more love, compassion, and empathy. Um, on the other hand, um, some other athletes um, commented that Deshaun Jackson's terms were twisted but kind of apologized for it. Um, they said that he was, he was misunderstood. Um, so I'm gonna take a minute and um, actually, if this works, play Julian Edelman's powerful statement um, that ended up moving, moving the needle and moving the conversation. I was afraid this may happen. I apologize here. I am not quite sure why this is not playing the way I tested it to. But those of you who may recall, um, Julian Edelman made a really powerful statement about uh, anti-Semitism. Actually, I think I can get it here. I've been getting hit up by everyone asking me about this Deshaun Jackson post. And I wanted to take some time before I responded because it's a complicated issue and I wanted to be thoughtful. I wrote down some of my thinking. I've seen Deshaun play in his career, make outstanding football plays. We've communicated over social media. I've got nothing but respect for his game. I know he said some ugly things but I do see an opportunity to have a conversation. I'm proud of my Jewish heritage. And for me, it's not just about religion. It's about community and culture as well. I'm unusual because I didn't identify as Jewish until later in my life. Whenever I encountered hatred, it never really felt like it was aimed at me. It was only after I was part of this community that I learned how destructive hate is. Anti-Semitism is one of the oldest forms of hatred. It's rooted in ignorance and fear. I remember experiencing a little bit of this hate in 2011 when I was called a kike on the football field. There's no room for anti-Semitism in, in this world. Even though we're talking about anti-Semitism, I don't want to distract from how important the Black Lives Matter movement is and how we need to stay behind it. I think the black and Jewish communities have a lot of similarities. One unfortunate similarity is that they are both attacked by the ignorant and the hateful. It's really hard to see the challenges a community can face when you're not part of it. So what we need to do is we need to listen, we need to learn, we need to act. We need to have those uncomfortable conversations if we're gonna have real change. So to that end, Desham, let's do a deal. How about we go to DC and I take you to the Holocaust Museum and then you take me to the Museum of African American History and Culture. Afterwards, we grab some burgers and we have those uncomfortable conversations. This world needs a little more love, compassion and empathy. Take care. So uh, 
That was a, a very powerful statement by some a very uh, influential athlete. And interestingly, his words carried more and, and, and got more attention than really any other leader of any other group, I believe, at that time. Before we move on to some other um, examples, I, I want to leave you with a thought about whether the apology itself, which is in blue here, take a moment to read it. Was it good enough? He apologized for his insensitive and ill-formed posts. My intention was to uplift, unite, and encourage. That didn't happen. I unintentionally hurt the community in the process, and for that, I am sorry. Um, You know, so take a look at that, and and when I'm done with the slides, maybe we can we can move back to this and have a conversation about wh whether how deep this apology really was. So we're going to leave Deshaun Jackson now and move on to some international sports. Um, I'm going to start with um, football, English football um, in Europe the other football. Since the 1970s, the London-based Premier League Chelsea Football Club has struggled to combat anti-Semitism from some of its supporters. In January 2018, the Chelsea Football Club announced a new campaign called Say No to Anti-Semitism to raise awareness and educate players, staff, and, and the wider community about anti-Semitism in soccer. In January 2020, coinciding with International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is coming up this Thursday, the club unveiled a mural that paid tribute to the memory of Julius Hirsch and Arpad Weitz, two Jewish soccer players who died at Auschwitz. The 40 by 23 piece by British Israeli artist Solomon Souza, whose grandmother escaped the Nazis in 1939, hung up in the stadium until the close of the soccer season in May. Chelsea also announced that it would adopt the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's working definition of anti-Semitism, saying it was the first sports team in the world to do so. The players and staff will be educated on the subject and the definition will appear in match day programs. I mean, this is something that is sort of unheard of for US sports teams, and it, but it's, it's a, a measure that has caught on in Europe. Um, let's dial back to October 2019 in Halle, Germany, which was the site of an attack on a synagogue during Yom Kippur. Um, an armed gunman with a live streaming head camera tried to storm the synagogue and was uh, foiled by a, locked, a very heavy locked door. He did kill two people outside and wounded two more. Um, he uh, recorded a video with a lot of hateful anti-Semitic language, Holocaust denial, uh, a, a lot of uh, really disgusting comments about women and immigrants, and then declared the root of all these problems is the Jew. After the synagogue shooting, the four largest sports clubs in the city came together for a campaign of solidarity and determination. The Saleh Bulls, which were an ice hockey team, the Giza Lions, women's basketball, the Wildcats, women's handball, and uh, another soccer team called for a common action against violence, racism, and anti-Semitism. They held a rally in Germany um, behind the banner that read, Together Against Violence, Racism, and Anti-Semitism, which you can see on this shirt, and put together a fund um, for victims' families. So out of a horrible situation in this town. The sports teams really led the community in coming together um, and opposing and standing up against anti-Semitism. You know, Germany and particularly in Bavaria, um, you know, has a, a, a pretty dark history. When Hitler came to power, the football club of Bayer, um, which is the biggest sports club in Germany and one of the and was one of the biggest football clubs in the world at the time was denounced because the club president at the time and head coach uh, were both Jewish. Kurt uh, Landauer was the president of FC Bayer Munich and the head coach uh, were both forced to resign. Landauer was imprisoned in Dachau and um, 
because he was a decorated German soldier from World War I, was released and, and escaped to Switzerland. Um, more recently, that same football club, um, their player Leon Goretzka has been very outspoken about the difficulty of opposing right-wing politics, which is you know, re-emerging in Germany today and explain that as a professional footballer, he has the ability to express his beliefs in a way that perhaps other occupations cannot. And in February, visited the Dachau concentration camp and published photographs from, uh, from the memorial and wrote, never again, uh, never forget Dachau. So again, a football player using the power of celebrity to remind people of the past and to fight anti-Semitism. Sadly, that doesn't happen everywhere. Um, Holland, which generally enjoys a really positive reputation in terms of being a, a fairly safe place for, for Jews, um, is a, a place where the fans of the Dutch football team have been shouting the chant of Hamas, Hamas Jews to the gas at pregame rallies. Um, after, um, after a Dutch soccer star left his team to sign with its rival Ajax, um, which a, a team that affectionately called themselves Jews, he was drawn in an anti-Semitic mural that you can see there um, in Rotterdam. The mural uh, you know, uh, showed a depiction of him with a gigantic nose and the text that read, Jews always run away, meaning the player who left the team. Um, and they also, you can see he has a, a kippa on as well, as well as the yellow star. Um, following that, this, this one of the um, members of the soccer federation distanced, distanced himself um, from that situation and created sort of a, a counter protest or a counter cause um, to, uh, pushed back on that mural and started a campaign called Changing the Chance. Um, it's been a two-year project, an international collaboration um, that involved the Anne Frank House as well, um, and also has a, a film that you can look up on YouTube, um, a documentary and a practice guide on combating anti-Semitism in sports. Um, so again, out of a pretty, pretty ugly episode, there were very courageous sportsmen who stood up and challenged that. Moving on, since the Olympics are starting next week in China, um, it's, it, I can't talk about this topic without remembering um, not just the horrifics of the Munich massacre of the Israeli Olympic team in 1972, but the, um, I don't really have the right words for it, but the the U.S. Olympic, or the International Olympic Committee's refusal to really acknowledge those deaths for so many years. Um, they suspended the Olympics for 24 hours at the time, but then continued with with the, as if nothing had really happened. It took nearly 50 years for the Olympics to officially commemorate one of the the darkest events in Olympic history. But even before that, there was a, a, an act of resistance by US um, Olympian and gymnast, Ali Raisman, who um, in, nine, in uh, 2012 in the Summer Olympics did her floor exercise routine to Havana Gila. So it was the, you know, she won gold for that. And it was in a way a, a very subtle and nuanced protest to say, you know, like we are here and, and we're coming out on top. Um, actually, before I, I turn to this, I'm just, uh, we'll, we'll move into the legends of American sports uh, next, but I did wanna mention that next week, um, there is a different sort of protest happening at the Olympics. The US and some other countries are not sending official government diplomatic delegations to the Olympics as a way of registering protest against the Chinese government for its treatment of the Uyghurs and its internment camps. So, so this continues in, in different ways um, to this day. So I promised you we'd talk about Hank Greenberg. Um, 
there is a really fabulous film that um, is made by a filmmaker, Aviva Kempner, called The Life and Times of Hank Greenberg. She grew up in Detroit and was always, um, always idolized him. And she's a filmmaker and did an amazing documentary on him. Among the stories told in that film, which really still resonate today, um, in late September, 1934, he chose not to play in a crucial game against the Yankees so he could observe Yom Kippur. He was a hero to Detroit's Jewish community and only in his second season, um, but he walked right into his synagogue. And as he did, the congregants burst into applause as the four rabbis were engaged in prayer. As one of the people who were there recalls, here was this Jewish fellow walking into the synagogue. Six foot four, my God, nobody had ever seen a Jew that big. Everyone was five foot five, five foot six. Well, the Tigers lost the game five to two and won the American League pennant, but his decision to honor his heritage galvanized Hank Greenberg's bond with Jews. As was written by the Detroit Times um, at that time, the Jewish people could have no finer representative. I'm gonna share one additional story about Hank Greenberg because it, it really moved me when I was doing um, some work to dig a little deeper into this. Um, in 1931 in central Illinois, Hank Greenberg was heckled by the opposing team's third baseman with anti-Semitic insults. When he couldn't stand the provocations any longer, which ended up being picked up by the angry roaring crowd, he confronted the third baseman and was rushed out of the park by local police for protection. Every ballpark I went to, there'd be someone who'd spend uh, his time the whole afternoon just calling me names, he said in 1980. If you're having a good day, you don't give a damn. But if you're having a bad day, well, it gets you pretty hot under the collar. Uh, he uh, actually participated in a foreshadowing of some of the modern penalties for hate speech. In the 1935 World Series with the Tigers, he recalled members of the opposing Chicago Cubs loudly calling him Jew this and Jew that. The umpire attempted to get the players to stop and, cleared the Chicago, and it cleared the Chicago Cubs bench. A few weeks after the event, the baseball commissioners fined the umpire and three Cubs players for using vile, unprintable language. And uh, finally, um, because he was subjected to these anti-Semitic insults throughout his career, he was, it became someone who was really grew into a champion for social justice. He formed a really strong bond with Jackie Robinson when he became the first African-American to play Major League Baseball in the, in the 20th century. In 47, their careers overlapped for a year when Greenberg played his final season for the Pirates and Robinson debuted for the Dodgers. Days before they met, uh, according to the Journal of Sport History, Robinson and his family had received threats on his life and that of their infant son, Jackie. Junior um, and that he would be kidnapped. Members of the opposing team sat in their dugouts pointing baseball bats at him, simulating machine gun noises. The hotel in which the Dodgers stayed refused to admit Robinson. During the game, Greenberg told Robinson, don't pay any attention to these guys who are trying to make it hard for you. Stick in there, you're doing fine, keep your chin up. Robinson was deeply moved by the supportive words of Greenberg who praised uh, who was praised in the African-American press. Greenberg and Robinson remained friends over the years and at the end of his career as Cleveland's general manager, Greenberg would leverage his stature, refusing to let his team stay at any hotel that denied admittance to all his players, remembering when he, as a ball player, had been turned away from hotels because he was Jewish. Uh, Ennis Cantor Freedom, is, uh, has, has returned to the Celtics. Um, and I wanna call him out because he's been a terrific ally to our Jewish community. In 2019, when five people were wounded in an anti-Semitic stabbing attack at a Hanukkah party at a rabbi's home in Monsey, New York, um, you know, the rabbi who was gravely injured in the machete assault passed away a few months later. This incident took place after several anti-Semitic attacks in the Jewish community in Monsey over the span of a few weeks. 
Annis Cantor, he was then Annis Cantor, he took on the new surname of Freedom in the past year. He posted a Twitter message that expressed support for the Jewish community. He's a 27 year old Turkish NBA player who's Muslim and he tweeted, America has no place for hate. Our Jewish sisters and brothers should not be living in fear. Anti-Semitism will not be tolerated. He has been a very outspoken friend and ally of the Jewish community speaking at many events about genocide and at fighting anti-Semitism. And this is one of my childhood heroes, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I grew up in Milwaukee where um, he was a Milwaukee buck when he was known as Lou Alcindor. Um, he has a played in many, many years, but he's a six time NBA champion and hall of famer. He wrote a, a really compelling article in the Hollywood Reporter um, about where is the outrage over anti-Semitism in sports in Hollywood. You know, it was something coming from him that really made people sit up and take notice. Um, he noted the, the shocking lack of massive indignation um, over recent statements on social media by various sports and entertainment figures that perpetuated anti-Semitic tropes. That's not just including Deshaun Jackson, who we talked about earlier. You know, he, he made the statement, if it's okay to discriminate against one group of people by hauling out cultural stereotypes without pushback, it must be okay to do the same to others. It's so disheartening to see people from groups that have been violently marginalized do the same to others without realizing that perpetuating this kind of bad logic is what perpetuates racism. So again, you know, a, an ally in, in this fight who is standing up and using his celebrity to, to convey a message to people in ways that you know, us, us mere mortals cannot. And uh, I, I do want to say a word about ADL in sports. I mean, obviously, a lot of our work at ADL, we, you know, are fighting anti-Semitism and hate on a daily basis. We respond to incidents. There is a dedicated um, national level sports leadership council at, at ADL. Um, NAACP president and CEO Derek Johnson is a co-chair of the sports leadership council. Billie Jean King was uh, one of the first members of the Sports Council. She's no longer on it, but um, very prominent former athletes are partnering with ADL to increase uh, the sports community's efforts to build bridges of understanding and unity. Um, so that is, that is you know, one way ADL itself is involved in this area. So before I open it up for questions, um, a little quiz. Anyone have the answer? Who was the first Jewish major leaguer? Anyone? Lipman Pike. Yes. July 28th, 1887 for the New York Metropolitans. His stats, his batting average is 322 and 21 home runs. Second question. Very good, whoever answered that. Um, how many Jewish major leaguers were there on opening day in 2021? Sixteen. I'll just guess. Yeah, that's okay. a good guess. Uh, that, that, that's that's very generous. It was eight. I will yeah. name them for you: um, Max Fried, Alex Bregman, Jock Peterson, Dean Kramer, Kevin Pillar, Rowdy Tellez, Ryan Sharif. Richard Blyer and Ryan Braun. Last question, how many Jewish major leaguers total? But historically, total? I, yeah, I'd say, yeah. I'd say about 150. You are very close. Any other guesses? It's 165. Um, I have a, a little cover of the book, which is also right here. Um, but, but you can, there is an organization called Jewish Major Leaguers, and their whole re reason for being is to track um, Jewish Major Leaguers. Um, so a lot of what we've talked about tonight is 
you know, incidents, what happens when something anti-Semitic happens? And, you know, it's not just happening on the football field or the tennis court or the soccer field or in Europe or back in the 1930s when Hank Greenberg was playing. It happens every day, anywhere. And when it does, it's really, really important that you report it. Yeah, you know, obviously, if you fear for your safety, you call 911. If it's safe to do so, so say you encounter some graffiti somewhere, take pictures um, because, and don't try to clean it up. Let law enforcement do that, but take pictures so it's documented. You can report to ADL really easily. It's just online, adl.org backslash report. And it's, you know, the more incidents we know about, because we know incidents are, are hugely underreported, the more we can, we document them and then, then we, you know, numbers speak volumes, data speaks volumes. When we go and we lobby for legislation, say for more security grants, we're able to point to those numbers and make the case that anti-Semitism isn't something that happened in the past, it continues to happen now. So those numbers and those statistics that I showed you at the very beginning, um, they're only as good as the people who are actually doing the reporting to us. So I encourage you to report if you see something. Always attach any, any supporting materials like photos, videos, websites, and fill out the details. It, it shouldn't take very long to do it all, but we really urge you to do that. It's a really important way that you can contribute to this fight and com in confronting anti-Semitism. The framework that we use at ADL, um, and you can see the sort of replicated all the way up in professional sports, speak up, uh, make your voice heard, report the incidents, show strength, have conversations of understanding. That's exactly what Julian Edelman was trying to do. And share facts, get the, get the information out, shut down the, the rumors, the tropes, the lies. I mean, that's what Hank Greenberg did. And that's what you know, Karim Abdul-Jabbar is doing by his, his article and using his voice. And of course, be, be an ally, um, support the targets, whether you know them or not. Uh, stand up if it's a, a situation in a school. Don't put it all really on the students who are in a, a pretty difficult position in terms of standing up to power and authority to confront that kind of anti-Semitism. Um, be there for them, uh, to support them, and uh, be an ally online as well when you see things. And as a final, final piece, there's always more to learn. And uh, you can find a lot of this information and in, including a, a very useful toolkit on anti-Semitism on ADL's website. We have, um, I'll point out our anti-Semitic incident tracker where you can see where incidents have happened. Our heat map, which um, lets you know, you know, down to a specific community, how many incidents we've had reported real time of, whether white extremist activity or anti-Semitic activity, um, all broken down in, in many ways in which you can slice and dice that data. We have a hate symbols database, which is often a, a useful place to go if you see something that looks like graffiti, but it looks like maybe it has a message, like for example, the number 1488, which stands for the 14 words of the area nation and 88, which H is the eighth letter of the alphabet. So 88 is, um, for Heil Hitler. Um, so you can kind of decode those hate symbols when you see them. And you can find a lot of resources for educators, parents, and families. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I know we're almost at the hour, but we did start late as well. So I'm happy to stay on if you have any questions. So thank you, Peggy. Um, that was uh, fascinating. Um, and uh, unfortunately, very, very real. Who would have thought that in 2022 that we have to be worried about going to school in the United States, where I live in Newton, Massachusetts? It's on almost, almost surreal, but it's, but it is real. So you have um, certainly probably not woken us up, but just reinforced what we already know, that it's not all roses out there. There's a lot of anti-Semitism. I think that, <clears throat> forget that I'm a big Patriots fan, but I thought that Julian Edelman was just, that was just beyond words, outstanding. 
beyond beyond words. So we thank you so, so much for your time tonight. We did have um, a little technical or a big technical screw up, which <laughs> did cost us some um, time. So if you indulge us, we do have a few questions in the chat um, <clears throat> that I would like to uh, throw at you. And uh, uh, so, so one of the first ones, uh, which I uh, very, very relevant, uh, one of our people uh, watching this, Len, his former rabbi was the police chaplain in Texas and actually consulted with the hostage family. So uh, that is certainly getting a lot of press and uh, quite, quite fa uh, fascinating. So uh, comment, although anti-Semitic incidents have risen in the past year, it seems to me that the numbers in the ADL, ADL are lower than I recall from years ago. Do you want to comment on that, Peggy? Sure. Um, actually, from 2019 to 2020, there was a drop, not, not a huge drop. And um, our belief is that a lot of that was because of the pandemic. So a lot of the, um, a lot of our incidents are things that happen in the school itself, you know, swastika carved on a desk, that sort of thing. So, um, a lot of those incidents didn't happen in 2020, but where we had an uptick, although it didn't really, you know, I think there was still a net lower number in New England anyways, um, was in cyber crime, um, cyber hate. So a lot of things on the internet. And you may also remember that, um, you know, some of that ends up being pe people engage in this type of cyber hate, and then they're emboldened to actually act on their beliefs. So if you might recall in April, 2020, there was a man who put an uh, incendiary device outside an assisted living facility in Longmeadow, a Jewish assisted living facility. And um, he was convicted of a hate crime. Um, thank God that device didn't go off, but he was, you know, he, he got all his information by following radical sites online. Um, and he lived five minutes from three Jewish um, facilities in Longmeadow. Danny? Yes, go ahead. When I, when I posted that, I was not referencing anti-Semitic incidents, which I do believe was are rising. I was talking about the first poll that was put up there that showed opinions about what I call anti-Semitic mythology. Jews control the banks, Jews do this, Jews do that, Jews do the following. I'm 75 years old, which in this group is not that old. <laughs> it's, like going to, it's like the only place I can feel young anymore is to go to shul once in a while. Anyway. I got uh, you beat. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure I can see a few people have me beat, but that's okay. But you know, growing up, and I grew up in Newark for the, and you know, that Newark. Um, there was, I mean, all that mythology stuff from what I saw was much higher when I was a younger man. The, the, the amount of mm, American society who bought into that sort of stuff was significantly greater than 14% or 25%. It was, it was, it was pretty big. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it wasn't fun, but it was, and so in some ways, some of that has gone down, but there's no doubt. I mean, I, I, on the security committee of my shul, and, and you know, it's no doubt that the number of incidents seem to be in the last couple of years rising, which of course is consistent with anytime there's bad times, anti-Semitic, anti-Semitism, like other forms of prejudice seems to go up. That, that was the topic of a really good piece in the Wall Street Journal this weekend, which talked about the reduction of anti-Semitism uh, in secular America. Right. If, you, if yeah. you're an unaffiliated Jew, you're good. But if yeah. you identify or, right. Jewish... There's no quotas. And they said the real danger people have is going to shul or going to a JCC or going to a kosher market. That's where yeah. these acts are now. Because, you know, in the old days, my father, after World War II, went for jobs and all the people were anti-Semitic, you know, that interviewed him. They had quotas at colleges, you know, that, that exists until the 70s. But there's very little of that in the secular world. And it's the biggest threat to Jews, I seem, is going to shul, you know, basically, sadly, and going to Jewish, Jewish locations, which 
I guess, you know, the ADLs, I think pretty much aware, aware of that type of thing, you know, so it's really kind of a, kind of a shame, so. So um, I'm going to throw you a few more questions, Peggy, and then sure. we will um, wrap up. And I don't know if you have the answer. So Colin Kaepernick, which uh, you know got a lot of lot of press for kneeling, uh, and really has helped the Black Lives Matter uh, movement a lot. The question is: Has he ever spoken out against anti-Semitism, or are you aware of him speaking out? against anti-Semitism? Yeah, that's a great question, but I don't know the answer to it, but I'm, I'm gonna do some work and try to find, find an answer. Um, but I don't know the answer to that one. Okay. Um, yeah. Another good question, this is a sports and anti-Semitism. Uh, there's a few questions in here, I'll try to combine it. Um, so I can answer the, the one question, there are a, a good amount of sports team owned by Jews a very high percentage in proportion to our representation being 2% of the population. If you name me a major city, there's a probably good chance that one of the owners is Jewish. So that was one of the questions. Um, but they are also sports teams, this is a great comment, are large corporations with HR departments and diversity officers. And do they provide training about anti-Semitism, about hatred uh, does that exist and, I, and I'm not even I don't know so that's the question they actually do I mean I, I don't know if they do you know unilaterally across the board but I know in New England we have we at ADL have gone to some of the sports teams and and even some of the the minor league teams and done that sort of anti-bias training, which includes um, training about anti-Semitism awareness for some of the, the teams. So it, it does happen. Um, does it happen as systematically as we might all wish? I don't think so, but another, another area that we are, are pushing at ADL is really sort of in the to shine a light on anti-Semitism in the corporate world as well. So we are working with corporations to say, if you're going to have an employee resource group, you know, or an affinity group, you know, that's great. You can have your knitting group, you can have your like book group, but you know, you could also have a Jewish group. And if you're going to be doing your diversity training, um, you know, anti-Semitism is one more ism that should be included in the conversation. And we do that at, at universities too. I was, I was really pleased, some of you may be aware that um, Mount Holyoke College had a number of swastikas in the, the past four or five months. And uh, we worked um, with their administration and part of their Martin Luther King Day programming is including anti-Semitism as well as, as a number of other isms because you know, at the end of the day, they, they are all related. You can't be for one and against the other. So, um, you know, it's, you know, some days it feels like like a losing battle, but, you know, just one day at a time, we're, we're doing what we can. And, and honestly, many, many others and many communities, many people, you know, in those communities are, are doing the hard work every single day on these, on these issues. Great. So, Peggy, once again, um, okay. Thank you. So, any one more question? Does someone want to say, uh, Danny, yes, it's Tom. Tom. You no, know, it's Peggy, our immediate past president. No, no, the, the, yes. Peggy, the other mm -hmm. guy to call out beyond Julian Edelman was Ray Allen, who, when yeah. he was a basketball player, every time his team, a lot of, a lot of this was the Boston Celtics, went to Washington, he took the newer players to the Holocaust Museum. Wow. Uh, and that became, you know, he became, and he became, he had friends who were Jewish, but that it became very moving to him to be able to uh, sh share, again, with, with many African and African American ballplayers, struggles of other communities. Right. And if you were on our last sports webinar with Dan Grunfeld, who told his story of his grandparents and, and his dad, um, Ray Allen actually wrote the forward to the book. Uh -huh. And I asked Dan about that. And he said, I don't even know Ray that well. He just felt this was the right thing to do. Wow. So, 
yeah, there's a lot of stories we could tell. So thank you, Tom, for that. Um, so we are going to wrap up. So first of all, thank you to David Kravitz. David, uh, my co-chair on the Sports Affinity uh, works endlessly and tirelessly to make this successful and was really responsible for reaching out to you, Peggy, and uh, for getting you uh, uh, on. Despite all our issues, we still have 52 of you on tonight's call. So thank you. Thank you all 52 for joining us. And again, we apologize for the, uh, the technical problems that we had. We, um, we have our next sports webinar, going to be a little more lighthearted, but still uh, be entertaining. And that mark that down on February 22nd. You'll like this one if you like Jewish sports. Her name is Rabbi Shira Rosenblum. She is a conservative rabbi in Jacksonville, Florida. And that's nice. But the reason we're having her is that she is the silver, I believe silver or gold winner, one of those, at the Maccabea Games for archery, she, which she took up when she went to Brandeis and didn't make the a cappella choir and said, ah, oh, well, I want something to do with my free time and took up archery. And this will be her journey into, into sports. And she still teaches and she still does archery. And at the same time is a uh, full-time rabbi in Jacksonville, you can look her up. So we'll hear her story on February 22nd. Um, and then we have, uh, we have one in March, David, Yep. So March 8th, we have um, Eli Dershowitz. He was ranked as the number one fencer in the world in 2018. He comes from actually from Sherborne, Mass., uh, a Harvard grad. I think he's going to be absolutely fantastic. Uh, we've tried really hard to get him, and uh, his story is going to be incredible because he's won gold medals at Maccabea Games. I mean, this, this guy is the real deal. We really, really hope we have a big crowd for him. So, uh, so those are our two next sports webinars. We do have, uh, we have a uh, young woman who wrote a book, uh, We Share the Same Sky, uh, about her journey following her grandmother who was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, and that's gonna be sometime, uh, that'll be in April 12th. So we have lots of things going on down the pike. Uh, we hope this now, now I'm gonna be self-promoting. Right, Tom? We hope to see everyone March 31st <laughs> through April 3rd in Los Angeles because we're having a retreat and we're really excited about it. So if you want a good time, have a lot of fun and also listen to two of the U.S. Jewish community's premier speakers, Rabbi David Volpe and uh, Rabbi Arts Brad Artson. Come meet us and uh, join us in L.A. If you have any questions, give me a call. So that was self-promotion. Uh, but I could do that because Dave and I are the chairs of this. So, <laughs> so um, thank you again, everyone. This was uh, a very, very, very educational, uh, wonderful. And we, we owe you a lot, Peggy. So thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Take care. Thank you. Peggy. Thank you, everyone. Terrific.